Well, good morning once again. My name is Brian. Uh, I'm associate pastor here at the church, and it's an honor to be able to share God's word with you today. We're going to jump into it real quick. I was thinking during worship, I just loved the songs this morning, and I didn't tell the worship team by any means what I was preaching about, but that first song, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. If everything around me is shaken, that's all right. I've never been more glad. Ha! That is a message that just falls in line with what we're preaching about today, and we're going to get there. Uh, last week, we were in a series, or we started a series, I should say, called I Feel. And we're talking about our emotions, about what we feel. Last week, we talked about I feel weak. Some of you came in this morning, you're like, I had three cups of coffee. I don't feel weak no more. <laughs> you're well caffeinated, you're ready to go, but you feel weak. And this is what we learned. We learned that His grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect in our weakness. That is some good news, that even when we're weak, he is still made perfect in us. Amen? Amen. If you want to watch some of those, you can go back to Facebook or YouTube, and you can check them out. If you didn't get a chance to be here last week or watch it online, they're still up. You can watch it. It was great. Today, we're looking at I feel disappointed. <sighs> I was really hoping I got to preach on I feel accomplished. <laughs> it been so much easier, right? I feel like I've achieved something, or I feel good. That would have been a good one. But no, I feel disappointed. This is Super Bowl Sunday. We got any fans, football fans in the house? Like one guy. <laughs> All right, man, hope your team wins. <laughs> hey, there you go. All right. So we got one football fan. Well, Super Bowl Sunday, right? And I was thinking about how close maybe some of our teams were this year. Like the last second field goal that was missed, you know? Or the bad calls by the refs. What's going on with that? I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, but, you know, disappointments come. And for myself, I'm a Browns fan. So I live with disappointments, okay? <laughs> Beginning to end, it's all disappointing. Oh boy, oh boy, what are we doing? A few weeks ago, I went through Starbucks and I was like, I need a coffee. I was like, you know what? I'm really a Dunkin' guy, but Starbucks was available. Okay, so the Lord provided. So I was like, I need a Starbucks. So I go through the drive thru, I get my Starbucks, and my wife was like, hey, honey, can you go across the street and return a package to Kohl's? Amazon, right? <laughs> Everything's Amazon. I was like, yeah, sure, honey, I'll go ahead and return it. So I, I get my coffee, and I go over to Kohl's, and I step out of the car, and I go to take the first sip, and I take the first, it even says it on the cup, the first sip or something like that. It was like some marketing thing. And I take that first sip, and I'm like, oh, this isn't my white hot chocolate mocha that I ordered. I know it's a girl's drink. Go ahead and laugh. <laughs> That's what you ordered? I drink mine black. Whatever. <laughs> All right, man. I like a little sugar in mine. So it's a hot chocolate. I'm like, this is not even close. I mean, it's got chocolate in it, and I guess it is a warm drink, but I was like, this is, this is garbage. I was like, I don't want this. I was like, oh, this is supposed to be my white girl moment. I'm here at Kohl's. <laughs> I got my Starbucks. I'll put it on the gram, you know. <laughs> I was like, hey. <laughs> I didn't do that. <sighs> Thank God he stopped that. Um, so I called Starbucks. It was not that big of a deal. I said, hey, guys, you gave me the wrong drink. This is what I ordered. And they were like, hey, come on back. We'll, we'll hook you up. And they did. I went from having a tall, which is a small, to having a large which is a venti. I have no idea. This makes no sense to me. But they gave me the big one, and I got two drinks. And I was like, hey, the Lord is blessing. So I walked away not being disappointed, or at least not as disappointed as what I was, because I had to make a trip back. They didn't bring it to me. That's okay. <laughs> uh, but have you ever had disappointments in your life? You ever had expectations that you held real high, only to not be met? We all have had disappointments. Large, small, for different lengths of time, quite honestly, disappointments are inevitable. We are going to find disappointments in this life. It's just the simple fact. Maybe you had a dream job that turned into a nightmare. Maybe you had an investment that crashed. Maybe you had a health report come back not so good. Maybe you had a wayward child that keeps going their own way. Disappointments can really hit hard. And like I said, we've all had our disappointments. In Proverbs 13, 12, it says it like this. Hope 
deferred makes the heart sick. Makes the heart what? Sick. I think about that for a minute because literally when our disappointments don't turn out the way we want them to, I don't know about you, but for myself, there's a part of me that actually kind of feels sick. My stomach turns. I feel like, whew, I need to lay down. I, uh, I can't handle this. It goes on to say, but when desires comes, it's a tree of life. When expectations are met, it can bring life. Actually, the word disappointment, it comes from this middle French word, disappointor. I don't really know if you say it like that, but it was a French word, so I thought I'd try. It means to undo the appointment. So you have something planned, and the plan doesn't go as planned, therefore you are disappointed. If you ever was stood up on a date, I never was. <laughs> so I only ever dated my wife, so... It worked out. But if you ever stood up on a date or, or maybe like a concert you had scheduled, you know, they cancel it because of COVID or something like that, disappointment, right? You are disappointed. Here's what happens to many of us. Through our disappointments, we have stopped believing in a God-sized dream. We have stopped believing in a God-sized dream. I want to tell you today, don't stop believing in a God-sized dream. Because of the letdowns, because of the hurt, that we have went through, we have stopped. It would be like this. Let's say, ah, I've got a dream. Not the speech, I've got a dream. Don't, I, I know it kind of sounds like that. But I've, I've got a dream to be in the NBA. Ha ha ha, right? You think that's funny because I'm not that tall. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a little tall, but I'm not that tall. Not NBA tall, <laughs> but I got this dream to be in the NBA, and you say, well, that's a ridiculous dream, right? Let's go a little further, and let's just say, okay, uh, I've got a dream to be in the NBA, but not only to be in the NBA, but I'm going to beat the record for the most points ever that was just set by LeBron James. Now we're just getting absolutely ridiculous, right? Because my dream is not a God-sized dream. Now, your dream might be big, it might be small, but if it doesn't align with what God has for you, the chances are you're going to be pretty disappointed, Okay, maybe in this room you said, hey, I've got a dream. I've got a dream to have a yacht. Ain't nothing wrong with having a yacht. But I'm going to guess most of us in here couldn't afford the upkeep. It would be this big hassle. We would be all stressed out about it. Um, it would be cool for a while, but is it practical? I mean, all these things come into play. And, and let's just be honest, most of us can't afford a, a, a yacht. Why, why would we have one of those? But you keep pursuing this dream only to be let down. And why? Because it's not... A God-sized dream. And we do this many times, right? We have our own idea of what we should do. Well, there's a man in the Bible, and he went through a slew of disappointments. Actually, when I think about the disappointments he went through, it's hard for me to even try to feel the hurt and pain that this man went through. They were just that bad. But he did not give up on his God-sized dream, on the vision that God had put in his heart. I want you to stand today as we read the word. If you're able to, go ahead and have a uh, stand, please. And we're going to read this in Genesis 37, verses 3 through 11. It says this, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. That's that coat of many colors many of us know about. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down. To my sheep. And his brother said to him, Are you indeed to bow down to my, to my sheep? And his brother said to him, Excuse me, you are indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? 
Shall I, your mother, and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we thank you for your word. It's alive. It has meaning. It is relevant for today. God, I just ask as we hear it, as this message speaks to our lives, that we're able to understand that disappointments, oh boy, disappointments may come, but God, you never fail. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for every season that we're in because you're always good. We declare that in your name, Jesus, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. All right. I want to give you this statement. It's a little long, so if I were you, I'd probably take my phone out and take a picture of it. You can write it down if you want to. It's also in your notes if you're following them with those online. The statement is this. Don't let your disappointments distract you from your destination because your negative emotions can feed in to a disillusion of who you really are. I want to say it one more time. This is the statement. Don't let your disappointments distract you from your destination because your negative emotions can feed into a disillusion of who you really are. It can be easy for us to be so disappointed that we have allowed our emotions to drive us in a negative way. But if you keep your mind on the destination, what God has for you you can even in your hardest times pursue the life God has. We're about to see Joseph go through some hardships. There's one thing that we don't see Joseph doing, and that is feeding into these negative emotions. And I'm sure there was plenty of them. If he would have fed into these negative emotions, it would have been easy for him to forget what God had done for him and what God is going to do for him and the God-sized dream that he gave him. Here he is, the youngest of 11 brothers. He's his dad's favorite. You can see that clearly by the coat that was given to him. He's given all these types of gifts. All these favoritism is shown to Joseph. And I have to say, he's probably walking around. He's probably a little arrogant, right? He's got his nose up a little bit. And all of a sudden, his brothers, they're sick of it. They're tired of him. They're like, Joseph is, Joseph is, it's went to his head. But not only that, but hate just, just gets inside these guys. And they hate him so much, and they're so sick of it, they come up with a plan. So they get together, and they say, hey, when Joseph is walking through the desert, I got an idea. <laughs> Let's take him out. And that's exactly what they do. They pow, clobber him, hit him right in the back of the head. Boom, done, right? That was their goal. Well, they're like, what are we going to do with Joseph? So here's what they do. They, they dig a pit. They're going to put him in a pit. Sounds good enough, right? And I think of that pit. How deep a pit might be, Joseph's in this pit, how dark it is, it's isolated, it's closing in on him. They wouldn't have to dig it probably very big. They just got to put Joseph in there, put him in this pit, right? So there he is in this pit. And I think many times for us, when we think about disappointments, it leads to this, what I call this mindset, this, this mind pit. It's like in our heads, we have this pit. We have fallen in so deep that all we can do is think about what's been done to us, the hurts that we've went through, the pain that we've endured. And, and here's Joseph in this pit, right? And if you think about the treatment that his brothers did to him, all of a sudden, he, he's there and some slave uh, traders come by. And they come by and they see Joseph in this pit and he, he needs help getting out, of course. And there's a rich guy. And the rich guy's name is, is Potiphar. You can see that in scripture. But the rich guy buys Joseph up. Okay, now the story right now is getting pretty interesting because if you, if you follow along, this rich man has, has taken this man out from the pit, Joseph, and he's got him and he's like, hey, I can see leadership quality in you pretty much. There was no denying that Joseph had something going for him. And so all what we see is we see the, the rich man saying, I want to put you in charge of some things. As a slave, as I bought you, I'm going to put you in charge of some stuff because I can see that you can handle it. 
And that's exactly what he does. And he gets promotion after promotion. And all is going very well for Joseph at this point. You could probably say he's living his best life, right? He's got gardens, I can see. He's got pools. He's got filet mignon and fine wine. He's like, ah, oh, it's all happening for me. His journey group is the journey group everybody wants to go to. They're like, wow, this guy is such a good leader. We just love Joseph. He's awesome. But there was kind of a problem there. You know why? <laughs> because the rich guy's wife had the hots for Joseph. She wanted some JoJo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and he said, no, no. <laughs> but she did. She was like, oh, I, he's good looking. I want, I, I, I'm going to get me some Joseph. Well, Joseph's like, no, no, no. I'm not going to have any part of that. No, 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 no. Well, one day she got her opportunity. Left alone, she comes on to Joseph. And I can kind of see it. Like when I'm reading scripture, a lot of times I, I'm looking at it and I, and I can see it come to life. And I can kind of see her like saying, Joseph, I want you. And he's like, go, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And she's like, no. And she grabs him by the shirt. I've got to have you. And I'm like, ugh, <laughs> this is weird, man. Like, ugh. Like, come on. I, the Bible's like not supposed to be rated R. I don't want to. No, but, but she's, like, she's like grabbing him. And he's like, no, I'm not going to have this. He's like, first, he's like, he's like, no, I know who I am. And I know who, who, who I serve. I know the God I serve. I'm not going to do this. Well, what happens? She psh, rips off the shirt. Again, <laughs> and she, she's got his clothes. And she's like, no. And he leaves. He flees the scene. Now, she knows that, hey, this guy could tell on me. This could go really bad for me. So what does she do? Well, she's deceitful for one thing. And she says, hey, look what he tried to do. You know, I've got his clothes. And oh, boy, what a situation. So they bring in what I would say like the police, right, the cops. They come in. They're like, hey, arrest them. We're going to take them. And that's exactly what they do. They take Joseph and they throw him in prison. This poor guy, first he's in a pit, now he's in prison. It just doesn't seem like it's going very like, good for him. It's like up and down, right? A lot of disappointments. So there he is. He could be saying to himself while he's in prison, where's God? What is going on? First my brothers, now I get framed, now I'm in prison. He could have really had a hard time. But Genesis 39, we learn this. We learn where God is. God is still with him. It says, while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Turn to somebody beside of you and say, the Lord is with me. Go ahead. Say, the Lord is with me. Yeah, he is. And he was with Joseph. He was with him. So here's what happens. While the Lord is with Joseph in prison, again, the prison warden sees, the warden, it says, uh, paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because he gave him charge. He keeps promoting Joseph. So here's the warden, and he's like, this guy's great, you know? He's doing a good job, and so promotion after promotion, okay? And a lot of cool things are happening there. And, and Joseph, um, he sees himself in prison. So, so the, pain, the pain is still there, but God hasn't left, there's one main point that I want you to know about, and this is it. This is my main point. Disappointments repeat, but God never fails. We see these disappointments repeat in Joseph's life, but God never fails. And maybe today you've seen a lot of disappointments in your life, but I know from experience that God has never failed. Billy Graham said it like this. The time to prepare for life's disappointments and hurts is in advance. There's no better time than now to be prepared when disappointments come. You know, I want to get back to Joseph's story here in a minute. But before I do, I want to share with you my story a little bit. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to sit down because it's a, it's, it's a heavy story. When things are heavy, it's easier to tell them when you're sitting down. <laughs> so just be transparent with you. Um, so Joseph, he's got this hard story. And I was thinking about that and, and disappointments. And like I said, uh, Pastor Ross, he asked me to speak. And he said, hey, you're, you're going to be speaking on it. I feel disappointed. And he kind of was pretty much, he's like, because you got enough of them to speak about. I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> A little humor there, right? And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, I can do that, I hope, I think. And um, so I'd have to say it this way. I've been in ministry for quite a while. My wife and I, we've been serving in ministry really as long as we can remember because we both come from pastoral families. So it was just a way of life. 
But since we've been married, we've been vocational ministry for over 12 years, and uh, God's always been good. I want to say that first. God's always been good. Now, the circumstances, maybe the treatment, that hasn't always been good, but God's always been good. God has always showed us favor. And I told the church this in the first service. Um, I haven't shared this particular part of my story with a group of people besides the first service this morning. And I think primarily the reason for that is I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I don't want you to feel um, like what I'm telling you is from a mindset of being a victim or what I'm telling you is going to hurt the church in general. I absolutely love the church. My wife can testify to that. I love churches. I love people that serve in churches. There's nothing greater than serving the Lord. But our last time that we were in a church serving full time would have been... um, at the end of 2019, it would have been September of 2019, if I'm not mistaken. And we moved from Ohio, which is another story in itself, but we moved from Ohio to New York to serve. And I had high expectations, like really high. Like, I'm just going to be honest. I, I'm the kind of person that, uh, you know, if I'm going to serve the Lord and I'm doing it, I'm going to expect the best. I, I just not because I need it, but because I, I want to serve the Lord with, with all I've got, you know, and, and do it the best you can. So had high expectations. Well, we get there in 2019, and we go through a season of uh, Christmas, getting ready for that. We have a big Christmas services, which it was a large church, so we had a lot of services. And we come out of that season, and we go into 2020, or 2020, and many of you know what happened in 2020. That was COVID, right? We all went through it. COVID happens, and it was hard because, of course, we were doing all the online stuff, as many videos as we could you know, put out and, and posting daily and trying to you know, take care of, of the people in the church. And honestly, um, because it was New York, a lot of people were moving away. There was a lot of transitions going on. And it was, it was a rough season for sure. And we get out of 2020 and we go into 2021. And we had been in person service for a while. And I was on staff there um, as the worship pastor. So um, I don't think I told you that. I was on staff there as a worship pastor. And so we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. I'm leading worship. My wife is on staff as well. And there started to be this kind of this disconnect a little bit, probably, between myself and maybe. Um, the leadership and the staff, and I could kind of see that, and I didn't understand it completely why at that time. I kind of understand it more now. And uh, on a Sunday morning, I got done leading worship at our second service, and I usually hang around for a while because, one, if, if you're a pastor on staff, you're usually one of the last people to leave, right? You guys know how that is. And so I was like one of the last ones to leave. And, and I, uh, the pastor told me, hey, I need to see you in my office. And I'll be honest with you. I was just like, well, that doesn't sound too good. So I said, okay, what's going on? And apparently there was this letter. Now, I'm just going to tell you my opinion. You can have your own opinion if you want. That's fine. I don't really care too much. But um, <laughs> this, this letter came and it was anonymous. Now, in my opinion, when just the letter's anonymous, it doesn't hold much weight to me whatsoever, okay? You can't sign your name to it, then I don't really care what this is, to be honest with you. I trash it. That's me. But that's not what was done. And this letter pretty much said, hey, we don't feel that Pastor Brian is, um, you know, really leading the worship very well or can, can, can do it in, in a spirit-filled way and, and leading our worship. And, and it was very hurtful. Just being blunt, it was very hurtful. And it was completely targeted at me. Now, um, one of the things that I, I see now, and, and it took me a while, is I, well, I saw it, saw it then, but it was hard for me to speak up, is I, I knew at the time that it was just a seed of discord. It was one or two or a few people maybe just for whatever reason, and I have no idea what the reason would be, to be honest with you, coming after somebody in the church, that happened to be me, a leadership, just to stir some, serve the pot. And I was like, wow, this is not good. But I left that meeting that day, and I sat in my car, and I remember calling my wife, and actually I think I told you when I came home, I remember talking to my dad, I said, dad, this happened to me, and I got a great dad. I'm sure he's probably going to see this message, so 
he's a wonderful dad. He's a pastor as well. I said, hey, this is what happened. I need, I need some wisdom. I need to know what your thoughts are. And he confirmed what I was thinking. And I said, yeah, I don't, it, was, it, was, it was bad. So he said, okay. I said, all right, well, the next week goes by. And um, I lead worship the next Sunday. And Sunday's over. I go home, whatever. And Monday comes around and go into the church office. And at that time of the year, it was the first, beginning of the year. It was in January. And so uh, we have these evaluations and things. And oh, the, we were told, my wife and I, hey, we need to talk to you guys and be honest with you in front of staff and a whole bunch of people that were, or the staff that was there, I should say. We were told at that moment that, hey, this, this isn't working out. We're going to let you guys go. And I was crushed. I mean, I'm sitting there, and, and uh, I probably feel more hurt inside than when I show on the outside most of the time. Um, but my wife was just crushed and crying in the whole bit. and I'm sitting there like, what is happening right now? How, what, I don't understand this. And it was one of the most disappointing times in my life, to be honest with you. I was disappointed, one, in myself, because I didn't know what to do or what I did. I was disappointed in leadership, but I was disappointed in God as well. It was hurtful. And, you know, like I said, I hesitate to tell you this story because one of the first things we did when we moved here is I read that book that we have called Church Hurts. And if you've had any Church Hurts, I encourage you to read that book. It's going to help you out tremendously. But, and I had my fair share of Church Hurts in the past, but I thought to myself, this, this shouldn't be happening is really my, my first thought. Well, I don't know why it's happening. It shouldn't be happening. I felt just, it was, it was a mess. Told to, hey, you know what? This, this is the last day. Just at the end, just the end of the day, get your stuff and head out and get your stuff out of the office. It was just like, I, I don't know. I, I was in shock, to be honest. And that's exactly what we did. And I, I remember that week after, just feeling so disappointed. Mm, wondering what was going to happen. And uh, I talked to my family, and, and they were so kind to come out and help us move. And, and I called Pastor Ross. And if you may not know this, Pastor Ross is my uncle, okay? So he's more than a pastor to me. He's family. And I told him what was going on, and I said... I, I really don't know what to do. I mean, what happens when, you know, you serve the Lord and you feel like you're giving your all and it just falls apart? What do you do? I said, I don't know what to do. I said, but I've been praying this week. And he was on a trip with some guys. And I remember him calling me back and, and talking for a little bit. And I said, um, I, I'm afraid about it. And I feel like God is going to have us come out to Georgia. We're going to move out there. I said, there's, there's no, uh, you know, I, I don't have a job. One thing about, you know, losing your job at a church is you lose your job, you lose friendships, you lose a whole bunch of stuff. And I said, so I don't know what to do. And he's like, well, come on out. You can stay with me. I said, okay. So we stayed with them for a couple months so we get our, get our, get our back on our feet and the whole thing. And... Um, like I said, I was, I was questioning just God. I was, I was so hurt and disappointed. But I had to remind myself that disappointments, they're going to repeat, but God never fails. And just like we sing this morning that Christ is my firm foundation, I just started to encourage myself. I said, man, I'm going to read my Bible and encourage myself. And nobody else is going to, and I had family and people that were, so don't get me wrong. But in that moment, I felt like you're on your own. You ever feel that way? You feel lost? You feel like you're on your own? I'm sure Joseph felt that way, being there in prison. And, and I was like, you know, I'm just going to encourage myself. And I just started to read the scripture over myself and understand that he's not going to leave me. He's not going to forsake me. That his plan is perfect. That he's got me in his hands. And I, I would just, I just turned back on that. And I realized that, that Christ did everything that he had to do on the cross for me. That he gave it all up. And I was like, you know what, God, if you never did another thing for me, now I know he's going to do more for us because we're his children. But I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if you never did another thing for me, you did enough. You did enough. And as 
broken as I was and, and still healing from it to this day, I choose daily to put my trust in him. I choose daily to know that God has me. That disappointments, boy, it's a part of life. They're going to come. Christ dealt with all the things. And he still has me. And his love never fails. And so to this day, that's what I believe. And I believe that Joseph believed the same thing. And I did not forget about him. You said, gosh, Brian, you left Joseph in prison. He was in there for a while. I was in a state of not trusting God for a while. But because of his faithfulness, I look back on the things he's done for me and I continue to trust him. And Joseph continued to trust him. I want to get back to our story today. I know that's heavy, guys. But disappointments are going to come. But God never fails. He never fails us. Amen? Amen. So we learn that he's there in prison. He gets promotions after promotions, even in prison. The warden sees how valuable he is. Scripture even says that the warden didn't have to worry about anything under Joseph's care because he was just doing that good of a job. So here's what happens. The president, we'll call him, of Egypt. That's really what he was at the time. He's a ruler over Egypt, right? Pharaoh there, he says, hey, I've heard about Joseph and I had a dream and I don't know what it means. I'm not sure how to interpret it. I don't know what it means. Nobody can tell me what it means. He's like, but I know Joseph can. So he goes to Joseph in prison and he says, hey, Joseph, can you tell me my dream? And I like what Joseph had to say to him. He said, no, oh, man, I can't tell you your dream, but God can. He can use it through me. God can tell you what it means. He's like, okay, well, what does it mean? And Joseph tells him, he says, okay, this is what it means. For seven years, there's going to be incredible prosperity. Everything is going to go great for seven years. Everything you touch, everything you do, it's going to turn to gold. It's going to be awesome. He's like, but, I always hate those buts, don't you? It's like, ah, oh, here comes the disappointment. He says, but after those seven years, we're going to have another seven years, and everything is going to be horrible. It's actually going to be a famine. We're not going to have anything. We're not going to have the food. We're going to have to get ourselves prepared. So what happens? The president of Egypt, he says, okay, I got an idea. He said, you're the guy in charge. He's like, I clearly can see you're able to tell me the dream. You're telling me the vision, what, what's going to happen. There's nobody better to do it. And I can almost kind of see how Joseph was like, okay, well, let's get this done. You know, he's getting everybody ready. I don't know. He's getting the, the farmers ready. He's, he's getting contracts going. They're getting prepared for this. All is going pretty well. And then, boom, all of a sudden, the famine happens. And we see that everybody is needing food. That's pretty much happens in these things, right? You eventually start to run out. And so everybody's going to Egypt. They need food. Well, remember Joseph's brothers? Those guys, those punks that threw him in the pit? Goodness, come on, man, your own brothers. Well, they need food too. And there they are. And they're right there where Joseph is to get food. And Joseph sees them. And pretty much what happens is he's like, wait a minute. Do I recognize these guys? This guy looks a little familiar to me. It's been a long time, okay? I can imagine beards were longer or something. I don't know, right? A little bit of wrinkles wait, I know this guy. No, I know this guy. And it hits him. These are my brothers. Can you imagine how he felt at that moment? All those emotions stirring up. What is he going to do? You know, he's probably questioning them like, hey, you have a dad? And I can hear the brothers saying, yeah, yeah, we got a dad. You got any brothers? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, we got some brothers. And here's what he does. Joseph says, okay, well, I want to see you guys back in my chambers, all of you. Come on. So they go back in the chambers. And it reads on in Genesis 50 that what happens is he falls to his knees, Joseph does, and he's weeping before God. He's so hurt. He doesn't know how to handle this. I don't think I know how to handle it either. And it says, so in Genesis 50, that his brothers came and they threw himself down. So what happens is Joseph tells them who he is. They figure it out. And they say to him, his brothers say to Joseph, we are your slaves. They said, uh, you got, um, 
But Joseph said to them, excuse me, Joseph said to them, and this is one of my favorite parts, he says, don't be afraid, for I am in the place of God. We see Joseph first in a pit, then we see him in prison, but now we see him in the place of God. God is being good to Joseph. You intended to harm me, it says, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Basically, Joseph looks at them and he says, get up. I'm in the place of God. God had a purpose in Joseph's pain. I want you to think about this with me. Think through this for a second. If Joseph wouldn't have been abandoned by his brothers, if he wouldn't have gone into slavery, if he wouldn't have been thrown into a prison, if he wouldn't have been able to interpret the, uh, the president's dream, then he wouldn't have been made the most powerful man in Egypt. Then he wouldn't have been able to save the lives of a race, the entire nation of Egypt. He wouldn't have been able to save his own brothers. There was a purpose, a strategic plan that God had for him. You may say, yeah, but I don't know if I can see it in my life. I've went through so much. Well, I'm reminded what scripture says. It says this in Romans 8.28. It says, God works all things for the good of those that love him and that are called to his purpose. You've been called to his purpose. I want you to know that God created you. He meant something that God has a God-sized dream for your life. And he's going to take care of it. In your suffering, in all the pain, anything that you're going through, he's a God that won't leave us. Hebrews 13, 5 even says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So when disappointments repeat, and that's what we're looking at, we have to ask this question, how do we trust God to never fail us? How do we trust him? And it kind of hit me this week that we trust him. We trust him by what he's done and, and what we believe he's going to do in our lives and we look back at that. And what those are is those are times of faith. And, and I think about just trusting him. And I think about what it means. And, and it, I was talking with my son. And I said, hey, his name's Preston. I said, Preston. I said, I've seen you've been putting a lot of money in your, we, we call it like a piggy bank or his bank. And it's not. It's this. It's a Spider-Man bucket. It's way better than a piggy bank. I said, I see you've been putting a lot of money in there and filling it up. He's like, yeah, dad. And maybe he's saving it for a rainy day. Maybe, probably not, because he's six. <laughs> I mean, we can get him anything he needs for a rainy day. Probably saving it for a video game. But I said, hey, I see you saving all your money up. I said, that's a good thing, buddy. I said, you're putting deposits in there. You're getting ready for something. He said, that's right. I said, you know, that's kind of how our walk is with the Lord. I said, we, we, we make deposits in, and we make faith deposits is what I would like to call it. And when something happens in your life and you start to, to see something unfold and, and you're like, I don't understand this. And that's what happened with me this last time in ministry. I said, I, I don't understand this, but I remember what you did in the past. See, I understood that I was relying on his word and that I had wrote down different times. Mm. Mm. Different times that he came through for me. And those were my faith deposits. And guess what? When all came crashing down around me, I cashed in my faith deposits. I said, it's time. It's time to keep believing. It's time not to give up. It's time to know that God has a, a God-sized dream for my life. And that there may be disappointments. There may be the same disappointments. Because disappointments can repeat. But I knew this. God, he never fails. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you so much that your word is alive. Now, as we heard this message today, we decide to put our trust in you. That we may be going through some hard times right now. We may be going through, I don't know, financial struggles. We may be going through a struggle in our marriage. We may be going through health issues. The list can go on and on. And you see us, Jesus. You love us. So I ask that you would help us to trust you, to build our faith up. Lord God, we just come to you with empty hands, open hands, ready to receive all you have for our lives. Help us this week, Lord, 
to know the God-sized dream. If our vision seems like it's gotten a little blurry, I ask you to clear it up. Open our eyes to focus on you. Help us to see people the way you created them, how you love them. Help us to see situations around us that seem to be so hard, so little and small to you because you are a big God. We thank you, Lord. We understand that disappointments may repeat, but God, your love, who you are, you never fail. So Jesus, we give you thanks and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning.